It would be wonderful for all of us if every morning after we'd had our shower and have got ourselves ready for the day, we'd force ourselves to go into a small room, sit comfortably in a chair, and regard some important first principles printed on the wall in large letters. We might then meditate for a while and leave for work refreshed and with the important reminder that we need only stick to some basic principles in order to achieve the things in the kind of life we want to live. I was reading again the moral and political thought of Mahatma Gandhi. We recommended this book in Direct Line 15. Gandhi firmly held to the view that there are fundamental principles based upon the moral law. He wrote to an inquirer in 1932, When we've grasped fundamental principles, we should be able to apply them to any given set of circumstances. If we cannot do this, it means that our grasp of first principles is feeble. It's like geometry in which we can solve all problems based on a theorem we have mastered. Further, he repeated that whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. The law of karma is inexorable and impossible to evade. Karma is moral law. As a religious believer and an inheritor of the Indian tradition, Gandhi belonged to the classical tradition. He believed in the principle, a person is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks, he becomes. Now, as his biographer, Professor Raghaven N. Iyer, writes, No saint or politician before our century could have achieved in his lifetime the worldwide attention that Gandhi received. He had his detractors but made no enemies, and he won the deep affection of vast numbers of people as well as of his eminent contemporaries. He's been classed with the Buddha, Socrates, and the Bhakti saints of medieval India. He's been celebrated as perhaps the greatest man of our century by men as different as the Dalai Lama, E.M. Forster, and Lord Samuel. Einstein has surmised that generations to come will scarcely believe that such a one as this, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. Yet Gandhi himself said, I have no desire to found a sect. I am really too ambitious to be satisfied with a sect for a following, for I represent no new truths. I endeavor to follow and represent truth as I know it, and I do claim to throw a new light on many an old truth. So here, let us agree, was one of the greatest men of all time. He said he could present no new truths, but held to the view that there are fundamental principles to which we can return which will work for all situations. And these are the ones repeated again and again down through our recorded history by the greatest human beings our species has produced that we might have printed on that wall to look at and repeat aloud perhaps every morning before we begin our day, and which let's talk about, along with some other important principles, in this issue of Direct Line. Here we've touched on two. They are, whatever a person sows, that shall he reap, and a person is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks, he becomes. Now, here are two laws of human navigation which are as infallible as the movement of the heavenly bodies, stars by which each of us can set his course and rest content that he'll reach his destination. Now, that's good to know in these times. It's good to remind ourselves that out of the incredible welter of confusion we find about us, with signs of moral breakdown everywhere evident, we can quietly return to these great principles and get ourselves and our loved ones back on course. We all tend to give superficial credence to the great moral laws we were taught in our youth, but most of us don't really believe they're true. A president would never be charged with the articles of impeachment if he really believed that as we sow, so shall we reap. Members of the cabinet would never find themselves facing fines and imprisonment if they really believed that as we sow, so shall we reap. Now, one of the most important reasons for reading the moral and political thought of Mahatma Gandhi is to understand once again that you can't separate basic principles into two camps, one for ordinary people and one for politicians. It's like geometry in which we can solve all problems based on a theorem we've mastered. Now, once we understand it, these aren't happy little Pollyanna sayings meant only for the delusion of small children, but that these first principles are laws which cannot be avoided and which govern our daily lives whether we like it or not. We can choose to live with and by them and reap whatever we will from this most important experience we call life. Now, knowing we'll reap what we sow, we need only sow with deliberation, just as does the farmer. What do we wish to reap all the years of our lives? Then let us sow that, today and tomorrow, and next Friday, and the following Wednesday, and every day of our lives. That's just good judgment. But we must believe. 
that these first principles really work. We need to know that there's no escaping them. There's no place on earth to which we can run and hide from these unchanging laws. So why spend our lives in unending frustration trying to break them when all we need to do is live by them? By starting out each day knowing that as we sow, so shall we reap, we shall sow that which we're desirous of reaping. We shall sow that which is good, that which is a benefit, that which is productive, that which represents our best efforts. Saying that as we sow, so shall we reap is simply another and better way of saying that our, our rewards all the years of our lives will be in direct proportion to our service, our contribution to those we've chosen to serve. Now, that's not difficult, and it's great to be able to relax in the certain knowledge that we can reap abundance all the years of our lives. We know what we will reap simply by taking care as to what we sow. And we talked about Gandhi in the book The Moral and Political Thought of Mahatma Gandhi in Draft 915 and mentioned that to Gandhi it's necessary to do what seems to be right in scorn of consequences. And every single act must be justified in terms of the ultimate unchanging values rather than the immediate results that are expected to emerge. And I think this is the test of whether a person really believes in these laws or not. Every single act must be justified in terms of the ultimate unchanging values. That means that we never cut corners for the sake of expediency or feel that no one's looking or that there's no chance of being caught or detected or that this is a sure thing just this once and never again. There are no exceptions. Unless we feel it's worth paying the price, reaping what we've sown. It's as ridiculous to expect to get away with it this once as it is to expect one stone not to fall when we release it. If 10,000 stones will fall to the earth when released, the next one will too. There are no exceptions, and the ways of reaping the negative results of the wrong things we've sown are as numerous and as varied as are reaping the positive benefits of the good things we've done and are doing. In fact, once the conscious use of these laws is made a part of our daily lives, half the fun is watching to see how and in what form the benefits arrive. But best of all is the inner security that comes from knowing that no matter how confusing things become, how worried or anxious we may become at times, we can return to these great principles, take a deep breath, and start out from there. I should think these would be useful to those who work with those who find themselves overwhelmed by life. In this issue of Direct Iron, we're including these two great principles in the form of a pressure-sensitive sticker you may want to put at the top of your bathroom mirror or on the sun visor of your car, someplace where you'll see it every day, and be reminded that there's a way to win, despite everything that may come your way in the form of obstacles or tragedy. Living by these principles takes the confusion out of our lives and makes decision-making much easier. When we're faced with a situation, no matter how attractive it appears on the surface, which we know to be shady or shaky, well, there's no hesitation, no agonizing about it. We say no. It isn't a matter whether it's $50 or $10,000 or a million dollars or seeming benefit at the expense of someone else. We say no as a matter of principle. On the other hand, we say yes to things which others think excessively risky simply because they meet our preset parameters. And living by these principles, we can certainly say yes to life. Just a few minutes a day will do it, reminding ourselves of two principles which will keep us on course and assure our success. It's said that one of the most serious problems affecting modern life today is a kind of chronic depression. Not an economic depression, but a psychological depression. It's said to be affecting millions. And it's believed by such outstanding researchers as Kierkegaard that despair means not being oneself. If we look for the cause of our depression, it may often lie in what we're trying to do or the way in which we're trying to do it. We're not being ourselves, doing what we should be doing, nor working toward what we should be working toward. In some ways, our society is like a crowd of people rushing toward a fire sale. It's easy to get stampeded right along with them. We can find ourselves moving along with the crowd without knowing why and just assuming that because so many people are moving together, they must know what they're doing or where they're going. Not necessarily. Maybe we've been conned. And did you ever get a real bargain at a sale? Something genuinely worthwhile at less than its retail value, its real value? And maybe it's possible. But I never have. Usually you get what you pay for. And what looks like a bargain, as often as not, turns out to be a pile of junk. Not worth the time, effort, or the money. I think a lot of the depression around is caused by people not being themselves, but instead trying to fit themselves into a role for which they're not really built and which they really don't like. And the longer they stay on that treadmill, the more despondent they become and the less purpose they can find in living and keeping up the motions. Know thyself. 
Never was the ancient wisdom of Socrates more important than in today's world. And to know thyself is to find thyself. And when we find ourselves and get into the role for which we're truly meant, depression, despair will vanish. Nothing can make a person sick sooner than feeling useless, unwanted, unchallenged, and unneeded, or the feeling that the values other men pursue are empty and joyless for him. Find a purpose with meaning for you, and you'll be filled with abundant, radiant health. It'll seem as though you've found the fountain of youth, the way to turn back time and live days filled with charm and interest, excitement and fulfillment. I've met many people like this, and I'm sure you have too. I remember meeting the late Mr. Letourneau, the inventor of the bulldozer, and the man who built the giant earth-moving machines that everyone said couldn't be built. These people never seemed to age, and their minds and interests remain as young and healthy at 80 as they were at 20. They also seem to enjoy wonderful physical and mental health, and they're seldom depressed. The distinguished researcher in this field, Dr. Sidney M. Girard of the University of Florida, has said, in thinking about health, I like to conjure up the image of a family of germs looking for a home in which they might multiply and flourish. If I were the leader of such a family of germs and had the well-being of my family at heart, I would avoid any person like the plague so long as he was productively and enjoyably engaged in living and loving. I'd wait until he lost hope or became discouraged or became ground down by the requirements of respectable role-playing. At that precise moment, I'd invade. His body would then become as fertile a life space for my breed of germs as a well-manured flower bed is for the geranium or the weed. To become the kind of person who's too busy and interested to get sick or depressed, we need one of two things, ideally both. A fascinating role in which we can completely lose ourselves, something we can do that's so right for us we delight in it, or a powerful purpose, a real reason for getting out of bed in the morning, something toward which we're working and want very much to have or achieve. That's why people with settled purposes, people who know who they are and where they're going, actually achieve their goals. There's just no stopping such a person. He's filled with too much energy, too much drive and purpose, too much good health to stop. And alongside this person, most other people are like pallid imitations. When we find ourselves in our true place in the scheme of things, it's as though we tap some secret wellspring of energy and we become self-actualized, as Dr. Maslow liked to put it. We simply live closer to our real potentialities, and as a result, we live more than other people. We get a lot more out of life. We began our direct line with two principles which the great Gandhi used to help him guide his life. Long before Gandhi appeared on the scene, back in the year 1723, a 17-year-old boy arrived in Philadelphia without a penny to his name. At the age of 42, he retired, wealthy. During his lifetime, he also became the country's most outstanding statesman, scientist, and philosopher. He helped draft the Declaration of Independence and was one of its signers. He was the first American success of the Horatio Alger variety. And he was, of course, Benjamin Franklin. And he used the living by principles method, too. Having an inventive mind and just starting out and deeply in debt, he looked for the essential principles of successful living. And after much thought and study, he devised a method so simple, yet at the same time so practical, that anyone can use it. He chose 13 principles, 13 subjects which, if he could master them, he felt would lead to the success he sought. He gave a week's strict attention to each one so that he could practice the entire list of 13 subjects four times a year. When he was 79 years old, he wrote more about this idea than anything else that ever happened to him in his entire life. Fifteen pages. For to this list and the way he practiced it, he felt that he owed all his success and happiness. And he ended by writing, I hope, therefore, that some of my descendants may follow the example and reap the benefit. So, for any person who wants to be as successful as Ben Franklin, here are his thirteen principles. The idea is to practice each in order for a week, going through the list four times a year, every year. Number one, temperance. Eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. Two, silence. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid trifling conversation. Three, order. Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. Four, resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. Five, frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself. Waste nothing. Six, industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. Seven, sincerity. Use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly, and if you speak, speak accordingly. 
Eight, justice. Wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duty. Nine, moderation. Avoid extremes. Forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. Ten, cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. Eleven, tranquility. Be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable. Twelve, chastity. And lastly, thirteen, humility. Imitate Jesus and Socrates. And no one before or since has been more successful than Benjamin Franklin, and he gives the credit to that list of thirteen principles, each to be practiced in order for a week at a time, so that all of them can become habits. They'll work today as well as they did then. I've got another book to recommend to you, particularly if you're the fast-moving, high-powered, racing-the-clock type of person. The book is entitled Type A Behavior and Your Heart. Now, here's a book that might add years to your life, and good years, too. These are the cardiologists who have identified the number one cause of heart attack. And there's a lot more here than good medical advice. The title of the book is, again, Type A Behavior and Your Heart. It's published by Alfred Knopf. It's by Meyer Friedman and Ray H. Rosenman, both medical doctors and both uh, having spent many, many years of their lives studying this particular subject and working in this field. Reading this book will cause a person to take a new long look at himself and his life and goals. The type A person in a headlong rush toward success is more often than not in a headlong rush toward a coronary and so busy trying to avoid wasting time that he wastes his life instead, and they point out that hurrying seldom accomplishes anything worthwhile. In the chapter on what to do if you're type A, the doctors point out that if you are a type A person, it's more than likely that you've never submitted your basic capacities and qualities to a rigorous self-appraisal. If you wish to diminish the intensity of the behavior pattern, you must try. Until such an appraisal is made, you never will know just how strong or weak your intellectual and emotional processes really are. Lacking such self-knowledge, you can't help feeling insecure. Your basic security does not depend upon, nor can it be safeguarded by, the opinions of your friends and associates. It depends upon your own precise awareness not only of your positive qualities and capacities, but also of your inadequacies. In fact, facing up to the latter, your inadequacies may well increase your sense of security rather than diminish it. If you possess an absolutely unbiased picture of yourself, you'll become far less dependent upon the opinions of other persons, and far less inclined toward a frenzied career of acquiring more and more numbers. You'll begin to understand that you've harried yourself mercilessly and needlessly in the past in an essentially vain effort to gain security from outside events and persons, when the only real hope for such security lay in frank self-evaluations. And so they then offer a ten-point personal appraisal questionnaire. One, in a meaningful self-appraisal, you must first attempt to determine just how intelligent, how precipient, and how creative you've been in your job. Two, you must examine your sense of humor to determine how it served you. Is it chiefly a repository for jokes and anecdotes, or does it function as it should to help you perceive your own occasionally ludicrous aspects? Three, you must assess your capacity for flexibility, for change of pace, and for rapid adaptability to change. Four, you must look at your leadership qualities and determine their worth. Five, you must examine all the activities that now absorb your intellectual, emotional, and spiritual interests. How many of these activities have to do with your concern with art, literature, music, drama, philosophy, history, science, and the wonders of the natural world that envelop you? Six, you must seek out and assess the intensity of your free-floating hostilities. As you do so, don't allow either rationalization or sophistry to blind you to their possible presence. Seven, you must try to estimate the ease with which you can receive and give loyalty and affection. Eight, you must attempt to determine the amount of sheer courage you possess. And if in this essay you detect some very large yellow splotches of frank fear in your personality, don't overlook them. Treasure them, just as you will treasure the steel-gray masses of frank courage you're likely to find there, too. Nine, you must dare to examine critically, as we were doing in the beginning of this issue, your ethical and moral principles. How honest have I been in my life? How often and under what circumstances have I cheated, lied, and borne false witness against my neighbor? 
These are questions you must not fail to present to yourself, and painful as it may be in the beginning, stubbornly persist in providing yourself with true answers. Ten, and finally, you must not be afraid to ask, and this one's really important, and to persist in asking yourself over and over until you have answered the question, what, apart from the eternal clutter of my everyday living, should be the essence of my life? And I found it to be one of the best self-appraisal questionnaires I'd ever come across. And I found it quite difficult to take. I found the final question particularly tough. Finally, you must not be afraid to ask and to persist in asking yourself over and over until you've answered the question, what, apart from the eternal clutter of my everyday living, what should be the essence of my life? But there's so much that is excellent in this book. Be sure to read it, even if you don't think you're a type A. It's one of the few how-to books ever to be selected by the Book of the Month Club and was already in its fifth printing by the time I got my copy. Over the past few years, I've been seeing more and more of this kind of common-sense advice which runs against the current of the traditional acquisitiveness of our society. And I like the doctor's use of the word numbers. So many Americans are concerned about numbers, and in so many ways... The doctors believe that the incidence of severe type A behavior, the acquisitive, hard-driving, what-makes-Sammy-run, how-many-numbers-can-I-stack-up kind of behavior, will wane during the next few decades. The American man and woman are not stupid, nor have they inherited any great liking for tyranny, even if this tyranny is being exerted over them by their own habits, drives, and greeds. Well, they're quite capable of revolt. And it would appear that they are revolting against cardiovascular diseases in Canada, I hope this is also becoming true in the U.S. According to Canadian statistics, for Canadians under 65 years of age, deaths from the total of cardiovascular diseases are down 28%. From heart attack, 10%. From stroke, down 42%. From high blood pressure, down 87%. And from other types of cardiovascular disease, down 41%. As the public becomes more fully educated on the means of preventing heart disease, the prospect is held by medical authorities that heart attacks, the most common cause of premature death, could become a rarity within the next 20 years. Canadian statistics indicate that smoking, diet, and lack of physical exertion are the three main culprits. But the main culprit, according to the authors of this book, is generally overlooked. They call it the missing connection, and its name is stress. The reason that stress has been left out of so much literature on the heart is that it's difficult to measure. And doctors, scientists generally, don't like to fool with things they can't measure quantitatively. In fact, an impressive study issued in 1971 by a specially designated committee of the Royal Society of New Zealand concerning the causes of coronary heart disease, a single sentence is allotted to the factor that the authors of this book believe to be the major one. They, they wrote... Some members of the committee feel, it said, that until more satisfactory means of measuring stress are developed, that no firm conclusion should be drawn concerning this risk in CHD, coronary heart disease. In any event, the good doctors go on to say, emotional stress of any variety because of its resistance to precise measurement has been shamefully neglected by quantitatively oriented cardiac researchers. If the smoking of cigarettes could not be measured by the number of cigarettes smoked per day, if the ingestion of saturated fats could not be measured by the number of calories ingested, and if physical exercise were similarly incapable of being measured by the number of hours employed in this activity, none of these factors today would be considered as lethal as they are now. Nature, unfortunately, carries very little if man can or cannot measure some phenomena in terms that are acceptable to him. But let us not obscure the issue by reference to vague generalizations. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died, are dying, and will continue to die of the tragic complex of nervous factors that these authors have designated type A behavior pattern. Yet its existence has been largely overlooked because it still cannot be described in quantitatively acceptable terms. In their search for some reason to account for the epidemic-like increase in coronary artery disease in the past half century, most scientists sought for such possible changes in only those substances which man ate, drank, or inhaled. They were not acutely aware of any changes taking place in Western man's spiritual ambience, even though their own scientific colleagues were chiefly responsible for them. Like the rest of us, they were able to adjust to such changes because they occurred gradually. Although consciously we've managed to adjust to the emotional strains of modern life, 
The real question is whether we've managed to adjust our subconscious mental and our unconscious body process to these emotional strains. Several extraordinarily acute and percipient scholars of Western society were not at all certain that we would ever be able to adjust to the changes in our ambience. De Tocqueville, Thoreau, Henry Adams, and Sir William Osler, among many others, both in the last century and in this one, warned of the dangers of the increasing pace of living that was afflicting Western man in general, and Americans in particular. Anyway, stress is the missing connection, and you'll find out why and where it came from by reading this fine book, and may I suggest that you give copies of it to your friends. That's what I'm doing. You may help them live longer. Sixteen issues of direct line ago, when I first started this program, I recommended that we ask ourselves just what it is we really want. Chances are we don't want as much as we think we do, or as much as our society tries to push us into believing we do. We tend to be carried along by the crowd, keep up with the Joneses who are trying to keep up with us. By sitting down and working some of these questions out, we may well find that we don't need to strain and sweat and worry at all. We sure as heck don't need to hurry. By gradually removing stress from our lives, we can enjoy ourselves and our families more, accomplish those goals we want to accomplish, and enjoy the trip all at the same time. And maybe we can live 10, 20, 30 years longer without cardiovascular disease while we're enjoying the trip. As the doctors who've written type A behavior in your heart point out, many who now suffer from type A behavior pattern have probably always considered that it was doing them good in the sense that it was directly responsible for whatever success they achieved. To point out that, on the contrary, you've become enslaved to a rigid complex of stereotyped thoughts and habits that actually impeded your progress in life may at first seem absurd, but let's take a look a bit more closely at your life. First, review your successes. How often were they really due to impatience? Were you ever promoted or did you achieve success in your job, position, business, or profession because you did things faster than anyone else? or because you easily became hostile or belligerent. We've questioned hundreds of men, they write, who've become successful in various economic or professional positions. Not a single one of these men, when asked to deliberate a bit about the causes of their success, ever concluded that any component of type A behavior pattern had been significantly responsible. Actually, a continuous frenzied pace almost ensures later disaster in every field of human activity. Almost all successful ventures, whether or not they're initiated by excellent creative decisions and judgments, must be sustained by such processes. Even the most harried type A person will admit, regretfully perhaps, that the surest way of causing almost any project to fail, eventually, is to substitute hurried, stereotyped thinking and action for relatively leisurely deliberation and meditation. If there is one principle that should never be forgotten, it is this. The thrust of creative energy is always weakened by repetitive urgency. And so we can add one more principle to live by. The thrust of creative energy is always weakened by repetitive urgency. So what we're saying is this. If you've been successful, it's not because of your type A behavior pattern, but despite it. So we find that instead of the high-powered, full-speed-ahead, run-from-early-morning-until-late-at-night kind of behavior leading to the success we seek, it's actually a hindrance and leads to coronary artery disease. We need time to think, to meditate. We need leisure for good ideas to work their way into our consciousness. And as we've said before, one good idea can be worth ten years of hard, eight-hour-a-day work. Incidentally, if you are a type A kind of person, there's a special chapter on what to do if you're a type A. Drills, easy things you can do to move from type A behavior pattern to type B. And if you've already got some symptoms, there's a special chapter on coping with coronary heart disease. Because of errors in life habits or of the particular disorders described in Chapter 9 of this book or of both, it's probable that at least 5 million Americans now suffer not just from coronary artery disease, but also from coronary heart disease. That is, the narrowing of one or more of their coronary arteries has become severe enough to produce either symptoms of coronary distress, angina pectoris, shortness of breath, a serious irregularity in the rhythm of the heartbeat, or easily induced fatigue, or actual injury to the heart muscle. To repeat, coronary heart disease is coronary artery disease that has become severe enough to produce symptoms. And as George C. Griffith, past president of the American College of Cardiology and Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Cardiology at the University of Southern California, writes of this book, 
This publication will do more to prevent premature cardiovascular disease than any modern textbook of medicine or health book written for the general public. Every professional, every executive, and every literate layman should place this book on his must-read list. I hope I've been able to sell you. Fifty-four percent of all deaths, millions occurring many years, even decades before they should, are due to cardiovascular disease.